He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. G'day and welcome to Country Life, I'm Duncan Smith. Kia ora, great to have your company. Ko Janina Schwanaka TNA. We're talking caviar this week. It's traditionally known as a delicacy plucked from wild fish in the Caspian Sea, but it's also being farmed right here in New Zealand. We'll find out how a flood-prone vineyard on the fringes of Christchurch has tapped into a novel way to keep dry. Later, we meet those behind a much-loved woolen farm sock. The workers at Norseware's factory in rural Hawke's Bay are like one big family, and the firm's new owner has big plans for the brand. But first, to our monthly look at conditions around the country. Northland Titai Tokarau took a bit of a battering in recent storms, though there was no significant damage. Our farmer contact said the region could do with some more rain, having only recorded about 15 millimetres of rain this week. He expected grass growth to be slow and feed to be tight this winter. Around Pukekohe, weather and growing conditions were good until the last week in May when squally thunderstorms swept over the district. Some crops were damaged with forceful wind and pea-sized hail. However, due to the heavy supply of fresh vegetables in the domestic marketplace, losses are unlikely to be significant except for the grower. The dairy season is coming to an end in Waikato. It's been a terrific autumn, one of the best for a long time, says a local rep. The mood is pretty happy, following a reasonable payout and good winter cover. There have been reports of some slug damage, leading to regrassing. Sheep and beef farmers are hurting though. Feed conditions are good in Waikato, but prices are poor. Grass growth has been good in King Country, though it's been knocked back by recent frosts and rain. Some dairy farmers were still milking, but starting to dry off. Most were taking a break and thinking about next steps ahead of calving in August and a return to milking in September. Balancing the books has become harder, with rates increased proposals, high interest rates and rising costs. Taranaki also had a good dousing of rain this past week, but for farmers in the south it had come too late for this season. Most dairy farmers had stopped milking and dried off their cows by the start of May to help build pasture growth coming into winter. Many had already started eating into supplementary feed supplies. Milk production to the end of April was down about 4% compared to a very good season last year. It's been a dream run for kiwi fruit growers in Bay of Plenty and a season to remember. Harvest wraps up for most this week with some gold growers already into their pruning. The kiwi fruit has been good quality and there's been plenty of it. Growers are also celebrating after authorities said they can keep using hydrogen cyanamide, an agri-chemical used to help buds form. On the east coast to Tairawhiti, sheep farmers have started pregnancy scanning. It was a good summer and sheep are still in good condition, so good results are expected. There's been increased interest in sheep shedding breeds like Wiltshire's to beat the costs of shearing and fly strike. Cattle prices aren't bad and the region isn't too dry. Horticulturalists say it's been one of their best autumns. Current crops of broccoli, lettuce and salads are looking good, and the maize is mostly in. A drop in temperature has seen fruit trees across Hawke's Bay lose their leaves earlier than usual. This has allowed growers to get in and do some early pruning. Most apples have been packed and shipped off for export. Good quality fruit should make for a good eating experience, though the smaller fruit sizes have led to lesser volumes. The dry autumn is creating challenges for the region's pastoral farmers. Dry conditions across Manawatu Rangatike are considered unprecedented for May. Our farm consultant says the much-needed autumn boost never came. A lack of rainfall has held back pasture growth, and despite a bit of rain this week, winter cover isn't growing due to the cold setting in. Many of the region's farmers are looking to destock. The dry is even more extreme in parts of Wairarapa, where our contact estimates farms are down about 20% on capital stock. Most stock are going to the works for processing, though there has been some interest from buyers in parts of King Country and Hawke's Bay. The big concern is the mood among farmers, who are doing it really, really tough. Across Cook Strait to the Whakatū Tasman region, apple packing's done and dusted for a grower we spoke to in Motueka, Quantity and fruit size is down due to the dry summer, but the fruit quality and sugar levels are exceptional. 
he says 70% of the apples are going to Asia, with the royal galas having already gone. The rest will be going to Europe. Orchard pruning's underway, and there are no staffing issues. The dry conditions in Marlborough are great for grape pruning, now underway, but it's making life difficult for farmers. Our contact in Linkwater had to dry off her cows three weeks early due to the lack of moisture, and the production levels are down for the season. She's wintering her cows on farm, and fortunately, she's got good winter reserves of hay and a big pile of maize silage in the pit. Our contact at Barrytown on the west coast reckons he's the only farmer who hasn't dried off his herd. That's happening this weekend. He says milk production was up on last year and generally it's been an outstanding season, with rain and sun coming at the right times. Cows are on grass for the winter break and getting a top-up of silage and baleage. May has been cold in Canterbury, with frosts the norm, and on the whole it remains dry. Together, those conditions don't bode well for pasture growth. Dairy farmers are drying off and animals are moving to grazing blocks. Overall, milk production's been good this year. Arable farmers are planting the last of the autumn-sown cereals, and most farms are loaded up with store lambs for the winter. Central Otago sheep farmers are busy crutching ewes. A farm at Otarahua told us more people are using mobile crutching trailers now, instead of shearing sheds, as it's more cost-effective. The trimmed wool is dumped, as it costs to get it processed. He says it's a shame, as the wool's great for insulation products. There's a bit of colour on the hills now, but water levels in creeks and dams are still low. Winter feed crops are struggling due to the dry autumn, but crops under irrigation are OK. The final Brass Monkey Motorcycle Rally was held in Otorohua in 2021. It was always held on the Queen's Birthday weekend. The farmer says some bikers still turn up, though, so he'll open up a paddock for them. And finally, Southland's been unseasonably wet and cold, so most dairy farmers have dried off earlier than usual. Tractor works ground to a halt after 50 millimetres of rain this week. Cows are behind wire on winter crops, and it's muddy under hoof. Ditto for sheep who are making a mess on kale, swedes and fodder beet. People are thinking about year-end results in next year's cash flow. A farmer near Gore told us there's lots of head-scratching going on. You're listening to Country Life on RNZ National, 101 FM. I bet you didn't know that it's caviar season right now in New Zealand. Traditional black caviar consisted of the eggs of wild Siberian sturgeon, but most caviar nowadays comes from farmed fish, and the name also refers to the pink-coloured row of fish like salmon and trout. Mount Cook Alpine Salmon in the Mackenzie District began experimenting with caviar three years ago, and is in the midst of its short harvest period. Sally Murphy caught up with the company's chief executive, David Cole. We have a, a separate farm that we've set aside um, to grow these special fish, so we grow them to a larger size than our conventional production uh, freshwater king salmon. So these fish would grow to around seven, eight, nine kilos, and we feed them with a special feed that has a higher level of protein to give that extra growth. Our aim with this farm, I suppose, is to grow a very special fish that can exemplify and, and demonstrate you know, the very pinnacle of the way to to taste and experience uh, a freshwater king salmon, and that's through these very precious, unfertilised eggs. And so how do you actually collect the caviar? We grow all of our freshwater king salmon um, in the hydro canals in Mackenzie country there. So we have six or seven farms up there, and we have one of them, a smaller one, that's purely dedicated to growing the caviar fish. Um, Mm. And it takes, you know, at least three, maybe four years to be able to grow a fish to that size um, before we can um, harvest it and collect the eggs. So you actually cull the fish, cut it open and collect the caviar from inside? That's correct, yes. There are um, operations around the rest of the world that do harvest and grow caviar from Atlantic salmon. Um, It doesn't taste as good as as our freshwater king salmon, but in those um, operations, um, Atlantic salmon, you don't have to kill a fish to harvest the eggs. Um, Very different with a king salmon. It's just the genetic makeup. It's very different fish. Can you then use the salmon part of the fish as well? No, we can't really. And it's a shame. Um, Because 
No, it is a shame. But once a fish goes into its what we call maturing phase, where it gives over its uh, its flesh to creating these eggs, if you like, um, we can't really use the the flesh for for our normal harvesting. So yes, it's an either or situation. And so, how much caviar do you get from each fish? We get around about a kilo from each fish. These are quite big fish, you know. They're a seven, eight, nine, sometimes ten kilogram fish. Um, they they can be heavy, and we can get thousands of eggs, of course, out of out of an individual brood stock like that. And so you've been farming it and collecting it, selling it for uh, three years now. I think it is. How are sales going? Look very well. And and look, our limitation here is the number of fish that we can commit and dedicate to this this process. So this is the beginning of the caviar season. It's quite a short season. Um, it will only last several weeks. And the shelf life of our, our regular product, of course, is only about 10 days. So this is like a window. And we celebrate the season every year um, with the launch of, in this case, our 2024 um, fresh caviar. And we're getting a lot of excitement and interest from um, food service restaurants, high-end food service restaurants, uh, around the country and of course you can also buy it retail so it's all sold domestically yes it is at this stage but we're getting smarter and better at the way we're both collecting growing and packaging our caviar and we've been doing some work through our new product development team in Christchurch um, to see how we can apply some of our abilities if you like to to extend the shelf life uh, if we're able to do that, then we can um, logically extend um, the season and availability as well. If you could extend the shelf life, would that open the door to exports? Yes, I think it would. Mm. And look, um, I know our food service manager around the country, Michael Sprague, um, he would just love the opportunity to present it to Harrods in London. Uh, that's it. That's his goal. Uh, and... Um, you know, we're working hard to see if we can achieve that because it's a very, very unique, special product. Um, there's nobody else in the world that is growing it, um, growing king salmon caviar uh, the way we are purposely for this um, for this function. Sometimes you'll find other salmon producers might just extract the roe from a fish that's, um, you know, essentially matured. Um, but um, you know, we're we're very fastidious about the quality of the, the silky texture, these pearl-sized beads, if you like, that just pop in your mouth. It's quite, it's quite an exquisite sort of experience. What does it taste like? Well, we have two sort of varieties and ways in which you can experience this. We have something we call a molossal, which is a, um, a very subtle, delicately brined version of it. And there's a, an akura version, which is infused with a little bit of sake and soy sauce. It's more than just a flavour. It's actually, it's actually the texture of the way these pop in your mouth. And how much are you expecting to harvest this season? It's going to be around about that 500 kilos this year. That translates into about eight to 10,000 tins. And you mentioned a few times it's high-end stuff. How much is a tin? <laughs> well, if you want to buy a retail tin, for example, at Casador, it's probably going to cost you $35 for 45 grams. David Cole of Mount Cook Alpine Salmon. He was talking to Sally Murphy. Now we're heading to a vineyard and farm at Taitapu on the fringes of Christchurch to find out about an earth-moving project in flood-prone Early Valley. The paddocks leading down to the valley floor are being transformed into a series of low dams and basins. They'll capture stormwater that runs down a steep gully and off the surrounding hills during heavy rain. Brent Rawston from Rossendale Wines has teamed up with the Christchurch City Council to prevent the land from flooding. He's also developing some of the land into residential sections. Cosmo Kentish Barnes is with Brent on a hillside overlooking the project. We moved into the valley in 1952 when I was six months old and uh, we farmed on the flat and uh, because the farm would continuously flood, even though he put in drains and a, and a, and a pump to pump the water, uh, at the end of the day he gave up and said, well, I'm going to buy the farm next door, which never floods and is a bit more hilly country. Mm. Was this land used for what, sheep and beef? Uh, originally was cropping and then we planted a small vineyard up here on the slopes and then the rest of it was for uh, sheep and beef, mainly beef. Now we can see some uh, machinery in the distance working on the land. What 
are you doing here? We're just putting the final touches to stormwater holding capacity. It's a detention pond to, to hold storm water during a rain event uh, and the total storage of these four ponds in total flood in a big rain event can store up to 128,000 cubic metres of water. What's happened to all the earth that you had to dig up to make these ponds or shallow basins? Basically used in the walls because the is only in certain areas have we taken down the, the ground. The ground level in the bottom basin down by the woolshed is basically the, the ground level that it was before. So by just taking off the higher spots and putting them back up onto the sides, we've created the dam walls. How often does this valley flood? It will flood to a certain extent every year. Uh, it will flood virtually the whole of the valley floor about every second year, round about, oh, sort of quarter to half a metre deep and about every five to ten years it'll flood to an extent that it actually covers up uh, all the fences so at that stage it'll then flow across the old Taitapu road at the open end of the valley. So these basins will effectively prevent that flooding from, from happening? We won't prevent it entirely because there are other valleys that feed into uh, the, the valley floor at, uh, at, at Early Valley and Lansdowne Valley but we'll cut it down an awful lot. From where we are standing, it looks like you are building a sort of upper basin, a middle basin and a lower basin. When it's raining heavily, will these all be full of water? They will fill at different rates. The first one will fill because the outlet's going to be very small, only 100 mils yeah. of outlet. So it'll fill up remarkably quickly. It'll then go through an 825 pipe and then that'll fill up quickly and then they'll start to go over the spillway into the middle basin. And in the middle basin, the outlet for that starts off with a, a small pipe at the bottom and a slightly bigger pipe. That will fill up rapidly quickly, then it'll spill over the next spillway into the lower basin and so on. That sort of trickles itself down. In a big rain, we'll see all of them fall. You must get heaps of water coming down this rather deep gully. Oh yes, it's, it comes down at a great rate and uh, going up uh, in the hills behind us it go, there's a valley that goes all the way to the summit road uh, at the top of the Port Hills and all that water comes down through this farm and the, the intention was to be able to hold that water back for five to six days and stop it A going over the flat land to the south of us but also to slow water getting into the Horsville River which is the main river that goes from around the southern side of the Port Hills to Lake Ellesmere. So, we hold back that 120,000 odd cubic metres that will stop or help to lower the flooding from here basically to El Lake Ellesmere. Now you've been working on this project for years and you've been doing it in conjunction with the Christchurch City Council. How has that worked? Oh, it's almost the perfect uh, PPP, public-private partnership in many ways. Because this block of land was, tw was 28 hectares, it was zoned for four hectare block development. And so we set a value that the seven four hectare lots were going to be worth X. And so we did a deal with the council. We said, well, OK, if we use one hectare of that and choose the right blocks and, and, and keep nice building platforms, people can build nice houses with some elevation and overlooking the ponds. And the balance of those three hectares basically were of no extra value. As long as people got a nice one hectare building site, they'll pay the same amount with a getting the four hectares and the use of the four hectares or not. I had the huge advantage because we were able to therefore cluster the four of, of the four hectare lots in a small cluster. My cost of servicing them just fell through the floor. And so therefore I was gaining in terms of less infrastructure costs. I was still getting my seven lots to sell, but three hectares of their land has gone under the pond. So effectively you've gifted uh, the majority of this land, land, the 12 hectares of land, to the Christchurch City Council. Yeah, it's our legacy going forward to have created this. That land will never be able to be nope. developed nope. into housing? Nope. It's gone. It's taken out of the housing estate completely because that is doing the necessary stormwater retention for other developments that are going on around us. And the land to the north of us, is zoned for residential and, and there's enough land up there for 150 or more houses to be built in time and, and all of that land, the runoff from those houses will eventually be coming down to the valley floor. So in exchange for getting the land, the council are paying for these basins to be put yeah. in. How much is it costing? It's going to end up costing somewhere around about $40 a cubic metre to build these dams, uh, a reasonable amount of money to pay. But two years ago, they in the, in the Christchurch Press, they were promoting a 
project they're doing around at the Adventure Park where they're putting the same sort of structure in the bottom of that valley to store, we're storing 128,000 cubes, they have, we're building a structure to do 213,000 cubes. The estimated budget for their facility was and just under $150 a cubic metre and they even admitted in the article that inflation will make it more expensive than that. So we have, by doing a public-private partnership where we won, they won, everyone won, they're getting these stormwater ponds built at about a quarter of the cost that they're building them just around the corner. So are you managing the whole project? Yes, yes. I, I was silly enough to, to <laughs> dream about this project when, uh, when I was 54 uh, in 2006 uh, as a result of the subdivision going on above us. And it's sort of, for lots of I look down on that flooded valley all my life. I thought, we can, we can actually do something about this. We have the ability to do something about this. And if I do it now and I can promote it now before I get too old and we're just selling the farm off as four hectare lots, we can do it now because if, we, if you sold it at four hectare lots, there would be houses in the wrong spot to make this happen. You could never retrofit it. We had to do it whilst I owned it or you would never do it at all. Our listeners can probably hear a post driver. What's happening closer to us? Oh, we're just fencing off the sides of the access roads to these blocks that will go on the market September, October this year. And great conditions for that post driver because it's still quite dry, oh, it's, it's, it's not really, too muddy. It's not too hot for them either, yeah. which is even, even better. You've also been doing quite a bit of native planting down here. Tell me about that. Yes, well, the project really got started in 2017 we started to put rock rivers down the bottom of the, of the valleys that will feed water into the into the project so we went through and we planted uh, a large corridor for birds to be able to to migrate up into the port hills and then down back into the, the horsel quarry etc well it's going to be interesting to come back here after when right yeah after this <laughs> rain to see how this all works if that's yeah, okay for sure absolutely Now, Brent, we have come back down the valley to your vineyard and we can see the grapes all the way down the row here, which is, what, 200 metres? Yeah, 250 metres long. You've got netting over the vines still. Is that because you have a bird problem here? Yeah, we're we're surrounded by bird motels. Part of the problem of planting a lot of trees over the years that Shuli and I have been here is also encourages the birds. And there's, there's no way that... We want to get rid of our trees the, and the birds come with it, so they come with the territory. Uh, so the easiest thing is to, is to net everything. If we don't net everything, it'll be gone and yes. gone by the morning sort of style. It looks like you are not far off from harvesting. Uh, the Gewürz Tremina will harvest uh, next week. It's about a week away. It's uh, coming up nicely. It's, the flavours are quite good. We just need a, just a little bit more sugar. The Pinot Noir for rosé production, probably next week if we get time, mm-hmm. otherwise straight after Easter. Pinot Noir for uh, table production, uh, definitely after Easter. And we planted uh, about five hectares of Sauvignon Blanc here uh, November 22, and we'll harvest that for the first time this year. So that'll be interesting to see how Sauvignon Blanc goes mm-hmm. uh, 300 kilometres further south than, uh, than our vineyards in Marlborough. Before you put these vineyards in, you were mainly farming cattle here. Ah, we go back to prior to 1984, and we were big uh, cropping farmers, a lot of processed foods for Jay Waddy Canneries at the time, now Heinz. So we'd be growing peas and beans and broccoli and then dispersing that with wheat and barley and grass seeds and virtually everything else. So we were big cropping farmers. We enjoyed cropping. Uh, 1984 came along, subsidies disappeared overnight. We had to look to do something different. Uh, we decided that we would never ever produce a commodity again. We are only interested in producing product that uh, could be marketed under our own brand. And uh, that started with our beef cattle to uh, beef products to, uh, to Del Myers in Germany. Uh, we would send in the top three primal cuts, vacuum packed, chilled, air freighted in every month and did that for 27 years. And that led to the idea of uh, Burgundy and beef and so we looked to plant and did plant uh, Pinot Noir, which led to the fact of how we're going to uh, dispose of the early vintages. So we opened a little restaurant in an old building on our site, and that became very successful. And so it just it just all grew, uh, but it grew out of a dissatisfaction of ever going back to commodity production. We're just not interested. And it actually is relatively easy to develop and uh, a foreground story around what you're doing and uh, run a branded product. So what happens to the grapes that you grow here? 
We don't make any wine on the site at all now. We make uh, the grapes that are grown here, which will be harvested soon, uh, go to uh, Sherwoods and Wiper. And oh, they'll make okay. it for us because Dane Sherwood uh, went through the same viticulture courses as Shirley and I uh, at Lincoln, so we're long-term mm. friends. And over time, you've put in some vineyards in Marlborough? Oh, no, the vineyards we bought, <laughs> we all planted. It was far easier to finance a vineyard that was in full production because then you sort of harvested before you had to start paying the interest bills and the management bills and so you had that fruit that you could then put into the system that was able to pay the bills for the next year. The vineyards were planted the ones down here in Canterbury. Once the wine is made, do you sell it locally? Where does it go? No, 99%, fraction under 99% of our wine is exported, mainly to the United States, majority of the United States and a little bit into Canada. And how much wine are we talking about? Um, 60,000 cases. That's a lot of wine. Yeah, we f- fly very much under the radar, but that's our total production plus a little bit more. Uh, obviously, predominantly Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, which is what the world wants. And the company we deal with in the United States do the distribution and the retail. They've got retail, they've got uh, 250 stores in 28 states. What's that company called? Total Wine and More Limited. And the stores are the size of a reasonable size supermarket in New Zealand. And there is more than 8,000 different wine labels in every store. There's around about four and a half to 5,000 different beers in every store. And there's around about three and a half to 4,000 different spirits in every store, including 605 different vodkas. So it's an alcohol superstore. How do you ensure that your brand gets noticed by their customers? Uh, well, we we spend a lot of time doing wine tastings in the stores, and they have a phenomenal they have a phenomenal program behind their staff. And any customer looking lost, they'll approach and say, "Can we help you?" And they'll actually then start recommending the wines that will go with a certain food and certain. What a food. great service! And it's that amazing service. And they are running tastings Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, every week, every store. Do you make wine? specifically for that market? Well, we certainly have adjusted our wine production with that knowledge in hand. When we pick, how we pick, what the flavour profile is when we pick right through to making it. But it's made as a designer product. It's a moderate price wine. It sort of retails in their stores at sort of $12.99, $13.99 US, which is you know slightly below the average price. So it's affordable quality what we're going for. But we certainly have gone to the effort of trying to make a product that matches what the customer's wanting. Brent Rolstrom there from Rossendale Wines in Taitapu near Christchurch. He was talking to Cosmo Kentish Barnes. I'm Robin Green, I live at Tihoro Beach and I have to say that Country Live is one of my favourite programmes. Country Live on RNZ National. We're taking you back to Norsewood to what many consider to be the heart of this tiny southern Hawke's Bay town, a factory famous for its woollen farm socks. Hundreds of local people have worked at the Norseware factory over the years, but it's had its ups and downs. There was a time when its employees bought into it just to keep it going. Now it's under new ownership, and there are big plans to connect the brand back to the farmers growing its raw product, wool. Sally Round took a trip to the factory floor via the tea room. I'm Serena Montgomery. This is Sally Round from RNZ. Serena. Step into the tea room and it's not too long before you get a sense of just how close-knit the Northware and Northwood community is. Um, so Serena worked here when she left school, then ran a very successful hairdressing business for some time. And there are 19 back. staff here. Some have worked here all their adult life. They come from the small towns and settlements round about, Waipawa, Dannyvirk, Ormondville, and of course, Norswood itself. So, uh, Olivia is Serena's daughter, and Michelle is... <laughs> Sister? Family? Sister-in-law. 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 Yeah. And I'm not related. And, and, and it's not related. <laughs> the family feel is quite some change for owner Tim Dean, who took over in February 2023 after a career in global corporations, Fonterra and Goodman Fielder, to name two. Moving into socks, beanies and scarves is not a complete departure for him, though. He worked as a wool classer in his youth, and he does know a thing or two about brands. So let's go for a quick tour. Norsewares had a few owners in its 60-year history, including staff members themselves at one stage. And here in one of the storerooms, the staff have made their mark. 
Each aisle is named after either a current or a former staff member. There's OB Avenue over there as well. Yeah, yeah, and then I think there's Tingy's Line down there. Um, oh, Tingy's Lane. Tingy's yeah, Lane. Was, yeah, so, yeah, it's just a bit of fun, really. The thing that's really special about it is that if you have a really stable workforce, the skill levels build up over time and you know you, you end up with a, a competitive advantage because you've got staff that really know what they're doing and and that's part of the reason why Norsewear socks for example are such high quality because you've got decades of experience built up here you, you know you couldn't just take this place out of Norsewood and set up somewhere else you'd lose all of that expertise and you'd lose so much of the value. Norsewear was started by Norwegian Orla Rian, who started making socks and hats in his Wellington house in 1963. Who's this, sorry? This is Terence. Terence, How many years, Terence? I'm in my 46th. He's in his 46th year, two days sick, and 46 years. I must what? love the place, though. And, and Tinga usually comes in and sets up, start, you'll be here by five in the morning. In the morning. Um, so, yeah, Tingy's in at five. Uh, Zane often comes in with them and they get the machines all set up, warmed up, ready to, ready to go, and then six o'clock everything goes on. What are you doing there, Chapman? I'm threading up the elastic on a BR knitting machine that makes our farm flex socks. So these are the oldest. These machines were here when Ola and the founder, was here. These were the first original machines that came to Norsewear back in the late 60s, yeah, late 60s. And the Edmund Hillary yeah. What's your involvement with that? Well, that was probably done a little bit before my time, but basically that's what we're still knitting now, except a longer version of it. So Ed apparently chose the chunky sock to complete a traverse of Aoraki Mount Cook in 1971. The story is part of the company's folklore. We were trying to work out which machine actually... This machine would have been the one, one. that... This yep, one. How do you the know? The original machines. How do you know? Because I know the sock. <laughs> there we are. What made that sock so good? For well, you're talking 30, 40 years ago now, so it was just a pure wool New Zealand made sock. Hard wearing, very hard wearing, still is today. But they're not just stuck in the past. Apart from these original knitting machines, they have high tech ones too. So this is a, uh, this is a, a Cortese finishing machine so every single sock is checked again and put by hand onto a foil goes through uh, quite a lot of heat and steam and that sets the sock it actually shrinks it down make sure that it comes out exactly the right size so it'll go around there and then you watch it pop out and down onto that conveyor belt over there Sharon Doreen is at a more hands-on machine, closing the toes on the farm socks. She's 76 and still full-time. This, this is a brand new machine. Uh, so this machine only turned up yesterday, so Sharon's still uh, running it in. It's not been very nice to me. Hasn't it? No. <laughs> Talk me through what you're doing, Sharon. I'm just going to cut these off. I can lift that up like that, put the sock underneath it, and then I push it down, and then it does. You have to be pretty quick and nifty with that movement, don't you? Yes, the other one was much quicker. I'll get there in the end. I'm just folding it in like that, pushing it down. Lift that up like that, down. Done. How many socks have you uh, closed the ends of, do you reckon, in your career here? Thousands. <laughs> Absolutely thousands. How long have you been here? I've been here just on 33 years, but I've only been doing farm flip for about the last 15 years, and we sell a lot of them. Whoops. The best socks you can buy. We love having Karen here. She loves being here every time we talk about retirement, she tells me, don't be ridiculous. So, um, no, she's a really important part of the team and, uh, yeah, we love having her around. I do overtime if I need to do overtime, but not a lot. 
Let's rewind and head to a quieter spot and find out what made Tim jump into the woolly sock business in the first place and find out a little bit about his plans to make it work. I've spent a good deal of my career selling New Zealand commodities offshore and having um, those commodities get used by other companies that have brands and the brand value stays offshore. Uh, so I could see an opportunity here where we could take a brand like Norseware to the world and bring the goodness back home into a local regional community. So that was the first reason. Uh, secondly, I, I, I think that more and more people are thinking about where their apparel comes from. Uh, I think wool has got a very, very bright future in the apparel industry. And I think people are being more thoughtful um, with the brands that they buy. They want to know that they're made... Uh, ethically, they want to know that the people that have made them are paid properly, that the processes that are being used are sustainable. And so I could see um, that Norseware uh, does stand for all of that. Definitely needs some investment, but uh, you know that was the second reason I could see that there was potentially a really big opportunity if we could tell the story. So this is our yarn store, so typically we would hold up to six months supply. The yarn is largely New Zealand and Australian wool, as much New Zealand wool as we can. And you'll see over here, um, th this is woolen spun yarn, which comes from um, wool yarns just near Wellington. We use mostly worsted spun yarn and that is wool that has to come from New Zealand and Australia go offshore because there are no worsted smitting mills left in New Zealand. They, were, they, they all shut down and so we have no choice but to take our beautiful wool and send it offshore to be spun before it then comes back and gets turned into product. I think that the only way we're going to have a future in the wool industry here is you've got to connect brands back to, to the farmer. So um, I've started by making sure that the yarn that we use to make our work socks is sourced in New Zealand. The next step is to understand uh, which farms produce the wool that goes there. And then after that, um, and you know this is going to take some time, but after that my view would be that we would need to have uh, long-term contracts with farmers. You know, you're supplying this specification of wool for Norseware and then we need to pay them a fair price for their wool. So they would need to be paid more than they're paid on, on the auction market. Now of course that then increases the cost of making the socks, but if you've built a strong brand, then you can absorb those costs because people will pay a little bit more. And so that way you're sharing some of the brand value that you have developed back with the farmers that have produced the wool in the first place. And if we don't do that, the, you know, there won't be a wool industry. Farmers have to be paid fairly and at the moment in many cases it costs them more to have the wool shorn off the sheep than they earn from the wool that they sell. That's nuts. You've been in the global export world. This is going to be tough isn't it? Uh, it's certainly um, much harder doing it than talking about it that's for sure. Uh, look, this is a small business essentially it's been a real eye-opener for me. I've learnt a lot about how small businesses operate uh, and, and, and farms because farmers are also small businesses. I think the opportunity is massive and I think if we can get some other organisations in the industry to think differently as well and there might be some other companies that you know are keen to collaborate and, and work alongside Norseware, I think we can affect a big difference. Back to the factory floor. So this is a really high-tech uh, Italian Lenati sock knitting machine. These are about $70,000 each. Uh, highly sophisticated. You start with a computer program to design the sock. Then that gets turned into sock machine language. I think there's up to 1,600 lines of code uh, with some socks. Quite technical. That gets programmed into the computer in this machine. And then the computer tells the machine what to do. What is New Zealanders connection with the wool off the sheep's back? It was really interesting. We, we, we did a piece of market research to test 
um, the refreshed brand. There's no question New Zealanders do care deeply about where the wool comes from, where the product's made, the quality of the product. So why are they buying cheap socks from offshore? Probably because they're unaware that there's the opportunity to, grow, to, to buy fantastic socks that are made here. You know, I, I think it's probably more of an awareness uh, challenge than anything else. Despite the recession, sales have grown in the past year, but Tim's keeping numbers close to his chest. Remember those ups and downs we talked about earlier? Well, Tingy, the nosewear technician we met earlier, knows all about that. The day I walked out of high school was the day I started at Norsewear. There was no silver fern farms, there were no alliance freezing works in those days, so Norsewear was a huge employer. There was actually 100 staff on the floor when I started. Your kids have all worked here as yes, well? Yes, Ricky, Nadine and Matthew all worked here at some stage, as well as Lisa, my wife. Does it kind of keep the little town afloat, do you think? Oh, definitely. It's, it's changed a lot because we used to employ 80 or 90 locals you know, in, the, in our area, and that was a lot more wages, but still there's a lot of people rely on this for their income. Definitely. And they spend that money at the local or at the cafeteria, as Serena said, or at the shop. You go up you to the do. Norswood pub and you look at their feet when they take their gumboots off. You'd be hard pushed to find a cocky in this district that doesn't have a pair of Norswood socks on in some respect. Norswear is Norswood and Norswood is Norswear. That's it. It's just part and parcel of the community here. It has been for the last 40, 50 years. Now, even before Tim's Day, 18, it's always supported community events and everything all the time. Yeah. That's Serena Montgomery, who runs the operation here. Allowing firefighters that have worked here over the years, eh? Allowing people to go to fires, um, to serve their community, to golf clubs, to when the bowling club was open, to school, events, anything like that. And you yourself are a firefighter? Yes. Yes. Coming up 25 years this year. Yeah. So what happens when the siren goes off? There's quite a few of you here, oh, yeah. are there? <laughs> Tingin used to be the chief um, a couple of years ago, so yes, it leaves a little bit light on the floor but we do what we can do and <laughs> hopefully come back as fast as possible out of them. When I'm down here and I hear the siren I go all oh, right the factory's clearing out <laughs> and then people just drop everything and race out the door. So what did we have here a while ago didn't we? We had you, four. Junior, we had had a whole crew. four, had a whole crew that used to work here that used the to leave. Whole crew. Get the truck out. Yeah get the truck out. <laughs> Just Back about. to Tingy, who's retired from the Volunteer Fire Brigade now, but still kept very busy on the factory floor. So I program machines, fix knitting machines, sort of do everything in the factory that's required. Operate machines, even sweep the floors if we need to. Everything. Everyone mucks in in this factory and does everything. You've seen a few owners come and go, yeah. haven't you? I originally started with Ola Rian, who was the founder of this company, but when he came up from Johnsonville as the um, Norwegian ambassador for one of our centennials, uh, one of our jubilees up here, and he had a choice. He was going to buy a factory in Awakuni because he was an avid skier, or he was going to, or, and when he fell in love with Norswood when he arrived here, so that went out the window, and he brought a house up there and brought the old dairy factory, and the rest is sort of history. You also were involved in keeping the factory afloat when it went through hard times. What happened? Yeah. Well, I've been through two receiverships here and financial difficulties, and one of the things that came up the last time we sort of were in a serious receivership is where the staff had the option to join the buyout. The managers fronted up with the main bulk of the money and we were offered to put money in to become shareholders of the company, which about 20 of us did in those days. So we did that and we got a little return on our money every year, a dividend and a dividend and a dividend. And we got a little but return. it wasn't easy times. They had to pay royalties to use the Norsewear brand, which had become separated from the business along the way, and lowered tariffs meant cheap socks from China. Tim was able to buy back the logo when he took on the business. Well, we've been lucky. As we've got in financial trouble, certain people have come along like Tim at the moment, who's been so generous to the community and the, and the staff in this company. They've, they found a passion for Norsewear. I don't know how you describe it. They come in here and they see what the company's about and they realise there is a future if it's well managed and run properly. Even you know, in New Zealand it's quite hard economic times, but there is a future for the textile industry, for the ones that can hang in there. And Tim's obviously picked up that passion, what we're grateful for. And hopefully, we've briefly, with him and Grace and everyone that's working here at the moment, we've um, breathed a new life into our name, which is huge. <laughs> Anna Clark hasn't been here quite as long as Tingy. She works dispatching the apparel around New Zealand. Some of it goes to Australia and the UK. And apparently Irish farmers like Kiwi socks too. 
Where's that one heading, Anna? This is for um, PGG Wrightsons for the field days. Mystery Creek, yeah, so we're getting all that together now. It's quite a big, big order. So. And they all want the traditional stuff, won't yes. they? Yep, absolutely. What have you got in there? Um, so we've got the kids' beanies um, and gumboot socks for the kids. So we've got pink and we've got charcoal, which is a... Are you off yeah. the farm yourself? Yes, I am. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I'm quite critical when it comes to socks, but now I've got my favourites. What are your favourites? Um, pink, pink gumboot. And this is really cool because... For me, it's sort of being a farmer and my husband's a hunter and a builder. It's sort of, you know, being able to see how things are made and, and whatnot is really cool. So, How difficult is it to get a job in small town New Zealand? Yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult. And it's also difficult for the likes of me being a parent, you know, because I do have to work around the kids. Um, and this job is perfect for that. Have yeah. you got any thoughts about the use of New Zealand wool in products oh, that are made here? Super important, super, super important. It's, you know, like I've, I've worked in sheds, I've worked as a Rousey and it's just such an important commodity and it's, you know, it can do so many different things and I mean, I use dags in my veggie garden, you know, like from socks to that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's so important and it needs to be looked after. So where to from here for Tim and his company? He points to a new report out which highlighted the obstacles and the opportunities for New Zealand's textile and apparel industry, worth $7.8 billion in 2023. Tim says Northware itself puts more than a million dollars a year back into the local community through wages. But if it's to be successful, he says the industry needs more support. Investment in education and apparel and, and textiles is, is basically, there's very little left here in New Zealand. So it's hard for me to find skilled people. Um, we're very fortunate with the skilled techs that we've got here, but we're effectively training people ourselves. I can't go out and find somebody that, that's done a course at the Polytechs or anything else. All of those courses are now gone. So the first thing is we've got to have a look at developing the capability. The second thing is, um, there's very little now in the way of manufacturing infrastructure. You know, I've got to send wool offshore to get spun and, and then come back again. And a lot of the infrastructure that was here 20 or 30 years ago has gone. Um, so that's the second thing that we need to think about. The third one is, I think we have the opportunity in New Zealand here, we're a small country, um, there's only 5 million of us, and we could actually... Um, develop a completely circular economy you know, in terms of slow fashion and then understanding where the stuff comes from and what happens to the end of life. We could become you know, the exemplar for the world. And although we might be small, um, if we can pull that off, then we become a highly desirable place for people to buy uh, clothing from. I think we've got a huge opportunity to grow value for this country by getting it sorted out. Uh, but we just have to think differently and we have to collaborate, work together. Tim Dean of Norseware at his factory in Norsewood. And that story was produced by Sally Round. And I can personally recommend those socks. They're the warmest thing when you're riding a motorbike. They have a great little sale in October. Socktober. Ah, something to look forward to. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for joining us. Now, we love getting your feedback and ideas for future stories, so do get in touch. Our email address is country at rnz.co.nz. Follow and listen to Country Life wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed the podcast, we'd love you to give us a plug on social media or tell a friend about the show. Just click the share button in this app to send this episode to a friend. The stories in this episode were produced and presented by Cosmo Kendish Barnes, Sally Round and Sally Murphy. And in the studio production team today, David Knowles and William Saunders. Catch you next time. Ka kite. Bye now. Bye.